Hey everybody, and welcome to our 10th video lecture. Today we're going to be talking about divergence and curl, which are two operations that we can perform on vector fields. To start out, remember that a vector field is a function which takes every point in R2 or R3 to a vector. In particular, a vector in three dimensions takes a xyz value to a three-dimensional vector, whose components are p of xyz, q of xyz, and r of xyz. We also have the notion of a scalar field, which is just a function of x, y, and z. And our two operations are going to take a vector field to either a new vector field or a scalar field. The divergence will take a vector field f and send it to a scalar field called div f. And there's many notations for this. Another notation that you might see sometimes is the dot product of the gradient operator with f. And I like this notation a lot because it reminds us that the thing that we're getting in the end is going to be a scalar because I'm taking the dot product of two vectors. I'm thinking about here the gradient operator as being a three vector as well. Just the components of that three vector are the partial derivatives. Partial partial x, partial partial y, and partial partial z. And we'll talk more about that later. The other operation I can do is the curl. And the curl takes a vector field and returns a new vector field, which we call the curl of f. And just like before, there's a different notation for this as well. And it's treating, again, the gradient op operator as a vector and taking the cross product of that vector with the vector field f. But it's important to remember the divergence here takes a vector field and gives us back a scalar field. And the curl takes a vector field and gives us back a new vector field. So the first thing I want to elaborate on is the curl. So starting out with a vector field, f, whose components are p, q, and r, we can define the curl of f in the following way. So the curl of f is, and this is just the best way to remember it, it's the cross product of that gradient vector with f. And I just want to remember how I do cross products. I do it by doing the determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix, where the top entries are my i hat, j hat, and k hat, the middle entries are going to be the first vector's entries. And let's remember here that I'm thinking about that gradient vector as being this vector who's uh, full of partial derivatives. So this middle vector then is going to be partial partial x, partial partial y, and partial partial z. And then the third component is going to be the components of f, which are going to be p, q, and r. So remembering how determinants works, this is going to give me the product of these two guys minus the product of these two guys times i hat. So it'll be the partial derivative of r with respect to y. minus the partial derivative of z, or of, of, excuse me, of q with respect to z, i hat, plus, and we're going to do the same sort of thing. Now the j hat term here is going to involve these characters, and there's going to be a minus sign difference. So the entry becomes partial p partial z minus partial r partial x j hat, and the third component is given by doing the partial derivative of q with respect to x minus the partial derivative of p with respect to y, which is going to give me partial q partial x minus partial p partial y times k hat. Or as a vector, we can write this down as just the vector with the entries partial r partial y minus partial q partial z, partial p partial z minus partial r partial x, partial q partial x minus partial p partial y. And that seems like a lot of equations, but remember, this is all coming from 
just taking that determinant expression and we remember how to do that so it's not that difficult to actually remember how to do this and in general I don't want to plug into all these different equations I got here I'm just going to back all the way up to my determinant expression and just calculate the determinant every time that'll help me to remember what to do now one of the things that the curl is really useful for is detecting conservative vector fields in particular I want to remember that a conservative vector field is one where it's equal to the gradient of a scalar function. That would mean that f is the vector whose components are f sub x, or we can write it as partial f partial x, partial f partial y, and partial f partial z. Let's try to take the curl of f and see what happens. The curl of f, again, this is the cross product of that gradient operator with that vector. So it's the determinant of that 3 by 3 matrix, i hat, j hat, k hat. partial partial x, partial partial y, and partial partial z, and then partial f partial x, partial f partial y, and partial f partial z, putting those components of f. And now if I calculate out what I get with this, as a vector, this is going to give me the first component being partial squared f, partial y partial z, minus partial squared f partial z partial y. The second component is going to be partial squared f partial z partial x minus partial squared f partial x partial z. And the third component is going to be partial squared f partial x partial y minus partial squared f partial y, partial x. Now, if I remember Clarence's theorem, I know that the mixed partial derivatives are going to all agree. So taking the partial derivative with respect to z and then y versus taking the partial derivative with respect to y and then z, that gives me the same thing. So this cancels. Similarly, this entry is gone and this entry is gone too. So what I'm getting in the end when I take the curl of a conservative vector field is I'm getting the vector 0, 0, 0. So that's the theorem that we just proved. If I have a conservative vector field and I can calculate those partial derivatives in the first place, that was really important there. And the, so those, first, those partial derivatives of P, Q, and R, the entries of F, exist, then the curl of F has to be 0. So this is a way I can detect if a field is not conservative, I just take its curl and I say, ah, well, it's not zero. It's not giving me the zero vector, so it can't be a conservative vector field. Let's look at an example like that. So let's consider the vector field F, whose components are minus y, z, and minus x. Then the curl of F is given by, again, the cross product of the gradient vector. Sometimes we just call that grad or nabla with f, and this is i hat, j hat, k hat, partial partial x, partial partial y, partial partial z, of minus y, z, and minus x. And when I calculate out what this is, the first entry is going to be the partial derivative of minus x with respect to y, minus the partial derivative of z with respect to z, and so all together I get minus 1. The second entry is going to be the partial derivative of minus y with respect to z minus the partial derivative of minus x with respect to x, so it's going to be 1. And the third entry is going to be the partial derivative of z with respect to x minus the partial derivative of minus y with respect to y, so that's going to be 1 again. So this is this vector. Note this is not equal to 0, 0, 0. So we can conclude. the f is not conservative. 
Let's look at another example. If I think about the function f, sorry, the vector field f, whose components are x, y, and z, I can calculate the curl of f, and I end up taking the determinant of i hat, j hat, k hat, uh, partial partial x, partial partial y, partial partial z, of x, y, z, and this is a good time to pause the video and try this at home and see if you get the, right, the same answer. Let's go ahead and do it. So I'm going to go and I'm going to calculate the first entry is going to be the partial derivative of z with respect to y minus the partial derivative of y with respect to z, which is going to be 0. The second entry is going to be the partial derivative of x with respect to z minus the partial derivative of z with respect to x, which is 0. And the third entry is going to be the partial derivative of x with respect to y minus the partial derivative of, oh sorry, partial derivative of y with respect to x minus the partial derivative of x with respect to y, which is 0. So this doesn't tell me right away that this is not conservative. And we can ask, is this conservative? <laughs> if you heard whispers, ignore the man behind the curtain. I am the great and powerful Wizard of Oz. Well, I can actually show that it is conservative. And the reason is f is actually the gradient of little f, or little f being the function 1 half x squared plus 1 half y squared plus 1 half c squared. In fact, uh, as long as we're on a domain, which is simple enough, this is exactly how this works. The theorem is that if I've got a vector field f, whose components are pqr, and everywhere in R3, pq and r have continuous first partial derivatives, then being conservative is the same thing as not having any curl. Now it's important here in the statement of this theorem that the continuous, that the, the partial derivatives of PQ and R have to exist and be continuous everywhere. If they have discontinuities, then there are counterexamples to this statement. In particular, it is usually the case that being conservative is a stronger statement than the curl vanishing. And there are examples where the curl vanishes, but the field is not conservative because there's some sort of points where the partial derivatives blow up or have sort of crazy experiences. To finish off our discussion of curl for the time being, I wanted to present some vector fields, one which is a stereotypical example of a field with lots of curl, and one which is an example of a vector field with no curl at all. On the left hand side, I've drawn a vector field in three dimensions, which exhibits some curl, and that curl sort of takes the, uh, takes the form of some sort of rotational uh, aspect. On the right hand side, I have a field with no curl, and this could be like the field, for example, f, whose components are 0, 1, 0. So it's always just a unit vector pointing in the y direction. And of course, when we take the curl of that, we don't have any, or, uh, we get the 0 vector, so we don't have any sort of curl at all. And this is characterized by the absence of rotation. In fact, uh, fields with curl equal to 0 are sometimes, for this reason, called irritational fields. So there's an absence of rotation. So the curl can be thought of as some measurement of the rotational component of the vector field. The next thing we're going to talk about is the divergence. And the divergence is not something in a dystopian teen romance novel. It's defined by taking the dot product with the gradient vector. So the divergence of a vector field f is that gradient vector dot product with f. So this is going to be the dot product of the vector partial partial x, partial partial y, partial partial z, dot with the components of f, which are p, q, and r, 
So this is a scalar value in the end. It's partial p partial x plus partial q partial y plus partial r partial z. As an example, let's think about the vector field f whose components are given by x, y, and z. And the divergence of f is just going to be the partial derivative with respect to x of x plus the partial derivative with respect to y of y plus the partial derivative with respect to z of z, which is just 3. One of the most important properties about the divergence is how it relates to the curl. In particular, I can start with a vector field, and I can make a new vector field by taking its curl. And then if I take the divergence, I'm going to end up with a scalar field. And I want to think about what that vector field is. So the divergence of the curl of f is given by taking the dot product, partial partial x, partial partial y, partial partial z, of the curl of f, which is the determinant of this 3 by 3 matrix. Its components are i hat, j hat, and k hat, partial partial x, partial partial y, and partial partial z, and p, q, and r. And if I remember how dot products work with curls, this is exactly the same thing as the determinant of the 3 by 3 matrix, where I replace i, j, and k with the entries of the vector I'm taking the dot product with. So this is exactly the same thing as the determinant of the matrix partial partial x, partial partial x, oh sorry, partial partial y, and partial partial z, partial partial x, partial partial y, and partial partial z, and p, q, r. And the thing I want to remember about the determinants of matrices is that when I have two columns that are the same, or two rows that are the same, like these two, the determinant is going to turn out to be zero. So this is what happens. The divergence of a curl of a vector field is always equal to zero. Fields with zero divergence are called divergence-free. Motivated by fluid mechanics, we also call these incompressible. The reason for this is something that we're going to explore a little bit later on when we talk about surface integrals, but I can mention it briefly right now. The idea is, if I've got a fluid packet whose boundary, you know, is described by some sort of closed surface S, here's that light coming off of that surface, say. I'm envisioning this as just like a packet of fluid inside a larger fluid. The if the fluid's moving, I can describe the velocity field as a vector field, u. And if I want to think about a fluid with constant density, so the density never gets larger or smaller anywhere, this is exactly what we mean by incompressible. I cannot squeeze my fluid so that it gets denser in some particular place, nor by releasing pressure can I let it become less dense. So in that case, the mass coming in and out of this particular volume that I've drawn is going to be given by the area integral over the surface of the density times the local flow field dotted with the normal vector at the surface. And we're going to talk a lot more about that later. But one of the things that we'll show is that this is going to be equal to the volume integral over the interior of S of the divergence of U dV. So in particular, if mass is being conserved, then the amount of mass that goes out of this volume is going to have to be equal to the amount of mass coming in because I'm not allowed to scrunch the mass up and then change the density at all. 
So what this amounts to is that this integral here would have to be zero. And that, since I could do that over an arbitrary fluid packet, this is going to imply that my divergence itself has to be zero. So for fluid flows where the density is not changing, these are exactly going to be divergence free fluid flows. And this is something that you see in a lot of different fluid flows. For example, uh, like water or air flows in situations where there's not a lot of temperature variation or there's not a lot of really crazy energies which can compactify things or squish things into smaller volumes. And there the flow will be described by something which is divergence free. So that's obviously a pretty important thing in physics. The theorem that we just uh, uh, used there, by the way, is the divergence theorem, which we'll talk about in more detail later. And one of the other things I can do with the divergence operator is I can define the Laplacian. So starting out with a scalar vector field, F, I can generate a vector field by taking its gradient. And then I can get another scalar field by taking the divergence. And this operation altogether is called the Laplacian and it's denoted by delta f. And it's the dot product of the Laplace or with the gradient vector of the gradient of f. So this is partial partial x partial partial y, partial partial z, of the gradient of f, so it's partial f, partial x, partial f, partial y, partial f, partial z. And if I write out exactly what this is, this is partial squared f, partial x squared, plus partial squared f, partial y squared, plus partial squared f partial z squared. So this is the Laplacian of f. And this is also is a very important operator that you see a lot of times in physics. So for example, if phi is the gravitational potential, then we know that the gradient of phi is the gravitational field. And the Laplacian of phi is going to be a new scalar valued function. This was a, in, in, in the intermediate we had a vector valued function, but when I take the dot product or take the divergence of that vector valued function to get the scalar back, this is going to turn out to be the mass density. So if I've got some sort of masses scattered throughout space, what exactly those masses are can be recovered from the gravitational potential by taking the Laplacian. these sort of ideas will have some really important consequences, especially in physics and other classes. The last thing I want to talk about today before I let you guys go is I want to think about a restatement of Green's theorem using these new tools, the divergence and the curl. So to start out, I want to think about a vector field, F, which is two-dimensional, and I'm going to make it into a three-dimensional object by just saying F of x, y, z is going to be some function p of x, y, q of x, y, and then the third component, the z component, is just going to be zero. So in this way I can make any two-dimensional vector field into a three-dimensional vector field, which is pretty useful because then I can do things like take the curl and that sort of thing. And what I want to notice here is that the curl of f This is also going to be a three-dimensional vector field. And its entries are given by the associated partial derivatives. So this will be 
the derivative of 0 with respect to x minus the derivative of p with respect to z, which is just 0. Sorry, I got that wrong. It's the derivative of 0 with respect to y minus the derivative of q with respect to z, and q here was independent of z, so it's 0. The second entry is going to be the derivative of p with respect to z minus the derivative of 0 with respect to x, so it's again 0. And the third entry is going to be the derivative of q with respect to x minus the derivative of p with respect to y. And this quantity here that I've put in this third entry should be a very familiar object from Green's theorem. In particular, I can state Green's theorem then in the following way. Starting out with a closed curve C with this positive orientation, I can say that the integral over that closed curve C of f dot dr is going to be exactly the same thing as the double integral over the interior of C, which is this red region R here I'm describing, and double integral over R of that qx minus py, but I can just rewrite that then as the cross product of f dotted with k hat dA. So this is a pretty cool vector version of the formula that we're used to before. We can also do a brand new equation, which is going to relay a line integral of the flux of the vector field over the boundary of the curve to the integral of the divergence inside the region. So to start out, let me just draw a region. And the flux integral, what that is, is locally around the boundary. I'm thinking about the form that my vector field takes, and it's going to be a little arrow. Sometimes it might be tangent to the boundary, and sometimes it might be sort of closer to orthogonal to the boundary. And sometimes it might even dip into the boundary. But at each point in the boundary, I know that a vector field f will give me a little arrow. And what the flux integral is going to do is it's going to calculate the component of that little arrow, which is in a direction normal to the boundary, so normal to the local tangent line of the boundary. So if I'm thinking about the vector field f as being something like the velocity of water or something like this, then this flux integral along the boundary is calculating exactly how much water is entering and leaving the boundary. Uh, these flux integrals also show up in electromagnetics and other areas of physics. Pretty much any time you can put a surface in there and you have some sort of vector field moving around, you can calculate a flux integral like this. This is the two-dimensional version of that where I have a curve inside a two-dimensional vector field. But the flux integral not, not to be confused with the flux capacitor, is going to be equal to the integral over that closed curve C, here my closed curve C is that blue curve again, of, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the dot product of my local force field with the normal vector through the curve at that particular point, ds. And you just remember ds here is the local arc length element, so this is just measuring the component of that vector field in the direction normal to the curve times that little ds, that little arc length element, and adding up all those together, so it's adding up the total flux. To actually calculate this though, it'd be useful to figure out what the local normal vector is. Now if I remember back to my previous calculus courses, I can get the local tangent vector to the curve. The local tangent vector, which is a unit vector of some sort of parameterization, is given by taking r prime of t and dividing it by the magnitude of r prime of t. And the normal vector, so the tangent vector on some particular curve, if this is my curve, the tangent vector sticks out this direction. So the normal vector is going to be the one which is orthogonal to that. So this is t. The normal vector is going to be this vector here, n, 
and it's going to be a local unit vector in that direction. So remembering that if r of t is x of t, y of t, then r prime of t is x prime of t, y prime of t. And if I want to find a vector which is orthogonal to this one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that normal vector n hat to just be, I just flip the entries and put in a minus sign, so it's going to be y prime of t minus x prime of t. And that's going to be orthogonal to the previous one, and it's going to stick outwards from the curve with as long as we're going around counterclockwise with a positive orientation. And in order to make it a unit vector, I need to divide it by the magnitude. But the magnitude of this new vector is the same as the old one, so I'm just going to divide that by r prime of t again. So this is our equation for the local normal vector to the curve. That's just a brief review of something that you probably talked about in your previous calculus class. So I can rewrite this integral here as the integral over c of f dotted with y prime t minus x prime of t divided by the magnitude of r prime of t. And ds I can rewrite as the magnitude of r prime of t dt, something that we talked about when we first introduced line integrals. And now this is just the integral from a to b. And my vector field I can rewrite as f evaluated at r of t. So this is what my flux integral becomes. And the nice thing that I observe here is that these r primes are going to cancel each other out, so I don't have to deal with any radicals at all, which is always a relief. Let's just be the integral from a to b of f of r of t dot product with y prime and minus x prime dt. But this is exactly the same thing as the integral from a to b. But remember the, the components of f are p and q. This is going to be q of r of t times y prime of t plus p of r of t and, sorry, minus sign p of r of t times x prime of t dt and I can rewrite that a little bit more this is equal to the integral oh, and I've messed this up, haven't I? so f had the first component equal to p and it's multiplying by y prime so this should be should have been p of r of t, and similarly this should have been q of r of t. But I can rewrite this now as the integral of p dy, that's exactly what that is, over the curve c, minus the integral over c of q dx. p itself I can write as an integral, or as a double integral over d using Green's theorem. In particular, by Green's theorem, the integral over c of p dy is equal to the double integral over the region inside of partial p partial x dA. And q I can write as the double integral over the region of minus partial q partial y dA. So altogether, this becomes the double integral over r of partial p partial x plus partial q partial y dA, which is the double integral over r of the divergence of f dA. So to summarize here, I found that the double integral over the region r of the divergence is related to the flux integral. So there's two statements here that we've proved, which relate the 
various area integrals of the divergence of the curl of some sort of vector field with two components, P and Q, two various line integrals over the boundary. And the first one was that the line integral over that, that closed curve C with positive orientation, that's that blue curve there, of the curl of F dot product with k hat oh sorry uh, got that backwards don't I uh, of vector f dot dr is equal to the double integral over that region r of the curl of f which is a vector and I dot product that with k hat so I just get the z component so that's a scalar now da the second equation said that the integral over C of the flux, which is F dot n hat, n hat is that local normal unit vector pointing outwards, ds, ds is that little arc length, is going to be equal to the double integral over R of the divergence of F, which is a scalar. DA. So those are two very useful identities, which are low-dimensional versions of some an analogous identities that we'll prove later on. In particular, we can take a, a line integral, and we can extend it to the notion of an integral over a surface. So I'm going to replace later on my line integral with a surface integral, and I'm going to replace the area integral inside with an integral over the inside of a surface, of a closed surface, which is going to be a volume. So the right-hand side is being replaced with a volume integral. But the use of the curl and the divergence won't change. And those will be related to various surface integrals. This is a good stopping point for now, though, so I'll see you guys next time.